Thank you, Paula, for behaving yourself. I appreciate that. And I'm going to ask um, the director of the NEA Health Information Network, Jerry Newberry, to stand up. Um, clap for Jerry. Because when I told him, I said, I, you know, I, I can't give a speech without telling a bunch of stories, but I would like to give some practical information. So give me a little bit about what the NEA Health Information Network is doing on bullying and safe schools. And he gave me like 17,000 pages that he wanted me to read to you, So, uh, which I will not do, um, but he will. So please pester Jerry and, and his staff that are here and uh, because he has no life. And this is, a, this is as close as he gets when people come up and go, please give me that link, give me that website, give me where I'm going to get those resources. Que honor estar aquí con ustedes. What an honor to be with you. And um, yes, if you, if you get a chance, read my bio. I am amazing, um, I must say. And you are probably after, after you read that lovely bio, which I made up, um, <laughs> you will be wondering why anyone uh, would pick me to come and speak to um, a group on GLBT, LGBT, Q, I, R, S, P, uh, and, or as my mother still refers to our caucus, the BLT, the Bacon Lesbians and Transgenders. Um, I'm from Utah. We don't let Democrats marry. Um, why am I here? I think I'm here maybe for two reasons. The first reason, number one, is that I am an educator. I am one of your colleagues. I am the vice president of the National Education Association. We represent many of you here in this room. And if we don't, I have a membership form for you. You're well, you, come on, join us. Um, and I represent over three million amazing men and women who have decided to make their careers in a public school, college, or university, and not one of them really thought that they would become millionaires working in a public school, college, or university. None of us got into this business to get rich. We are all over the map politically, religiously, some are very funny teachers, some are very serious librarians, some are very organized counselors, some have classrooms that are truly random acts of files and charts and books and papers. We approach our work in very, very different ways. We're very different people, but what unites us is our true love for our students. Mind you, we do not love them with that sticky, sweet, cutesy, oh, I just love those darling little boys and girls. Teachers with that attitude are eaten alive by second graders on the third day of school. <laughs> Their pictures end up on milk cartons, and we never see them again. Teachers and counselors and support staff and social workers and, and school custodians, we love our kids in very much the same way parents love their kids. We love them enough to nag them when we know they could be doing better. We love them enough to warn them when we see that they're doing something dangerous. We love them enough to show pride in them and encourage them and um, care about them beyond some idiotic standardized test score, but that's another speech. It's a really good speech, too. We, we love that whole blessed child, mind, body, and spirit. We love our students in very much the same way moms and dads do, and it's why this can never be just a job for us. This is our cause. This is our passion. This is why we get up in the morning. And we're not afraid of measuring our success, but we measure it in a whole life, a whole human happy child. Of course, a student needs the academic skills to succeed and proceed, but that's going to come from a lot more than memorized facts and figures. Is that child confident 
is that child understanding of choices? Is that child being encouraged to be creative, a questioner, a problem solver, a peacemaker? Is that child capable of seeing the consequences of their actions? Does that child understand that they are owed respect and that they owe respect to other human beings? Um, I gave the first reason that I thought I was asked to speak today because I'm a professional educator. But then there's reason number two, because I'm a mommy. I am the mom of a gay baby. Um, my little boy, uh, my child, I suppose child isn't technically correct since he's six foot four um, and is 35 years old and has an MBA. Um, <laughs> But he's my baby, like you are your parents' babies. And he's going to always be my child. And if you could see his, how he cleans his house, you would understand. He is such a child. What is with this kid? He has four dogs and seven cats. And he's still not sure, apparently, how to clean a litter box. So between the two of us, we have a don't ask, don't smell policy, <laughs> which actually works. But I guess I have to say that I do love my grand puppies. Um, mommies like me and children like my big baby are counting on you, as are all mommies and all gay children, because they live in a dangerous world. They live in a dangerous world. He is a long way from high school, and I still worry about him every single day. He and his partner, Mike, live in the most conservative suburb in Utah County, really close to Brigham Young University. And when I tell my friends that uh, Jeremy and Mike live in Eagle Mountain, they gasp, oh my god, and they mean it as an actual prayer. <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> and when he told me where he bought his house, I said, sweetie, do your neighbors know you're gay? And he said, yes, mom. I went to every one of them with Mike, and we introduced ourselves. I said, I'm Jeremy. This is my partner, Mike. And I said, they don't know what partner is. They think you guys do wallboard. Come on. <laughs> and he said, no, mom. They love us. As soon as they found out we were gay, they went, the gays are moving in. The property values are going up. You know, they were absolutely sure. And they actually do like their neighbors, and their neighbors like them. Jeremy said, you know, Mom, they're finding out what a gay lifestyle is. It means you mow your lawn. <laughs> it means you go grocery shopping. It means a wild night is two Netflix, you know? And um, he said, Mom, here's the thing. Mike and I were both born and raised in Utah. We actually have many Utah values. We value marrying the person that we love. We believe in marriage. And he texted me when the court case came in on Prop 8. And his text, I will never delete it. It says, Mom, Mike and I are no longer living in sin. Um, because he and Mike are legally married in the state of California. Um, it was important to them. And uh, they had a beautiful ceremony in another state, in the you know gay marriage capital of the world, Salt Lake City, uh, <laughs> Utah, where mostly my Catholic family were there, and my mostly Mormon in-laws uh, were there, and uh, where they got married in the little Unitarian church we've been to uh, since Jeremy was little. Uh, yes, God's frozen people. Um, and <laughs> where the minister has known Jeremy since he was 12 years old, uh, and my 82-year-old Mormon father-in-law was sitting there muttering to himself, I'm at a gay wedding. <laughs> but here's the thing. My 82-year-old Mormon father-in-law was at a gay wedding. And Mike's family were there, uh, brothers who'd been on a mission and all their kids, and they lent them one of the little one-year-olds to be the flower child, you know, um, down the aisle. And everybody was there. Not 
necessarily, I mean, I, I don't think anyone changed their religious beliefs or their political beliefs. They weren't there to show support for gay marriage. They were there to show support for these young men that they adore, that they absolutely love. They were happy for them. And they were happy that they had found each other and that they were going to be together in sickness and health for richer or poorer as long as they both shall live. And what parent doesn't want that for your child? OK, I, I guess there are parents who don't want that for my child, and maybe even for their children who don't believe that certain children deserve to be openly happy 